Welcome to Sussex Mastery. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. My name is Miranda Pierce. And this is the podcast that helps you raise the bar and thrive in your aesthetics career. Uh, we've got a really interesting one for you today. This is, we decided to go a little bit more into the history of how we've developed our clinic um, to help those of you who are trying to do the same. And we're going to go through some of the trials and tribula- tribulations and successes that have got us to where we are today and to help you hopefully get where you want to go a little bit quicker and Randa's going to lead that for us today. So we were doing a webinar the other night and you were explaining a bit about your the really early moments you know when you thought about getting into aesthetics and and what went through your mind and then I guess what's led you here today obviously we have a successful aesthetics business we have we're in Manchester and we also have a training company as well and it's a case of how the hell do you get from even considering aesthetics right through to the end goal so remind me obviously I was there but remind me like what what made you what kind of first piqued your interest in this industry well it's strange. Um, I think there was something unconscious going on for me around looking for little avenues to where, where I could better express myself. So and that's a very high level thing. So, but it's around this idea that you know I've always been slightly entrepreneurial. I wouldn't say extremely entrepreneurial. Like you know, I tried to sell a few things on the school playground when I was a kid. I remember um, thinking I could. I got a discount on computer games and uh, through my bank, and I thought, well, maybe I could sell them at the normal price at school. That really didn't work. Um, (laughs) But at the same time, you know, I had that inkling and it was about, for me, there's an element of independence and uh, and a kind of a kind of daydreaming of I wonder if I could have my own business in some way. And then basically aesthetics landed in front of me and I thought, um, after doing some maths, which we'll get to, I thought I should definitely do this. There were various things that appealed to me. I was really a doctor and, and it's, it's that element of private practice. I think I always, I always wanted to do some something that would be just my own, and I think that resonates. A lot of people say something like that. It's that that little corner of the world that you're in control of, that you don't have, you know, five managers and a boss and a, and, a, and all those kind of things going on that you can influence um, and grow in your own style. So I think that was part of it. Okay, and what kind of you'd already heard about it, but what was the moment that actually made you act and book your first course? Well, it was a story from our friend Beatrice, who I'll always be grateful to, who um, came around for dinner one night and she just dropped in. I think she said something slightly mysterious for Be- for Beatrice that I wasn't used to because we'd lived with her for years and knew her really well. And she just said something like, I have other sources of income now. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> interesting, Beatrice, you must tell me more about this. Um, and then she basically told me about her, her, she, her fledgling aesthetics business that she'd started doing, um, you know, three or four places that she worked at. Hadn't been doing it long, but she'd had some success. And she basically break down, broke down the rudimentaries of the business model. And that was the bit, for me, that was the eureka moment was, okay, so essentially the mathematics. Um, it costs this much, it retails for this much. The in-between bit is the opportunity that's, mm-hmm. that's available. And she also told me her route to market, which is a technical way of how do you actually get customers? And so, that was all the information I needed to think to have enough certainty to go off and investigate it. Because before then it was like, I'd heard of people doing it, but I, was, I didn't know how, like how do you assemble these components to make a business? Um, and hearing her story, which is really simple, you, you get the Botox from a pharmacy, you pay 145 pounds for it, and it retails for about 300, and the rest is yours to keep if you can get a client. So that moment was like, well, that sounds like a good business model. I can do that. I'm already doing injections. Um, I can handle patients. I, sh- I should try and do that. And I got within about 24 hours really excited about investigating and doing it. And then I started Googling and finding out more about it. Yeah. And did you have any worry in that first flush or were you just dead excited? Well, there's all sorts of things that come into your mind about this industry. There are lots of stereotypes, for example. So I did think that maybe everyone I treated would be you know, either a celebrity or have body dysmorphia. You know, there's that kind of everyone's going to be incredibly vain and superficial um, kind of fear. And that's not really me, but, you know, I, maybe they'll be like that. Um, there's the other kind of fear that you maybe mix in with. It's kind of like an American story of getting sued, which is that, you're, you know, your you're cosmetic surgeons are always getting sued. And you just imagine that it's a it's a scary place to go and you're going to be sued every week. 
Um, so there are, th- there are things like that that popped into my mind. So the, 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 the other thing is you're going to be by yourself. Yeah. That, that was a big element of it's great in the NHS in many ways because you're, you, you share the risk as a junior doctor, especially or um, in most teams, most of the people are sharing the risk. But there's suddenly this point where you're like you're stepping out on your own where the buck stops with you, basically. That was a different feeling. But I didn't I, don't, I have to say I didn't really think about that that much at the beginning. I just thought mainly of the opportunity and that I believed I could do it and I started to move towards it. That was more after your first training day, yeah. but it was there. And this was in 2007 that you first heard about the idea, wasn't it? And then you did the training in 2008, February 2008. Yeah. yeah. It took me a while to find a course. That, in fact, I had to try, I went up to Scotland, so it was a, a big trip um, ages from where, I, from where I actually lived. Um, but it had the right balance of things I was looking for. Looking back, it was really expensive what I got. Um, but, you know, I got started. I can't complain. Okay. And what was it about the NHS? Because you, ultimately, if you were 100% happy with your current job, you wouldn't have, your eyes wouldn't have gone elsewhere. You know, you wouldn't have played away, as it were. So what was it about the NHS that pushed you? Well, it was always my dream do- job to be a doctor. So it was quite a shock, basically getting there and realising how different it was, was going to be to how I imagined um, particularly in hospital uh, and, and this is something I feel really sad about because I think a lot of very idealistic people go into the NHS and you know it sounds cheesy but you want to save lives you want to make a difference um, and there are definitely moments where I felt I was doing that um, but there was an awful lot of other stuff that was getting in the way that ended up making you feel and I know a lot of people resonate with this is you end up in survival mode quite a lot mm. what I mean by survival mode is you're trying not to drop the ball and allow someone to come to harm on your watch versus trying to actually wade in on the front foot and make a big difference to people. So it's, uh, you know, it's the, it's the classic case of, you know, you're an hour late and, you know, a patient comes into A&E with something that's very concerning for them, but it's definitely not life threatening. And you basically have to be so super quick for that, for that because, and get them out of the department because you've got more, much more important things to do. And that sense, is okay and it sounds almost sensible to say it that way but it's but it's quite grinding as well it's quite relentless and then essentially the whole team in that in that frame of mind what i noticed as a, as a junior doctor is the whole team gets stressed and they start to snap at each other and and that was a big surprise to me that for a large parts of the day it may have just been my hospital but there, there was a lot of negativity between the staff which only comes from fear and stress you know these are good people who had good intentions like everyone else but and I'm, this was a real story. Once I remember my consultant coming in, a patient about to breach, snapping at me for the patient about to breach. And I, and I was immediately transferred that to the person who was owing me a, a urine dip test that I was waiting for. And that was the one thing I was waiting for, for discharging. She was obviously busy with seven other things. But we, the, the, this chain of stress kind of went round from me to her. And I basically don't fall out with people in life in general. I'm pretty good at um, at maintaining relationships but that that was a real low point because it was someone I was I liked and was friends with but we basically fell out over stress and the reason that happened was because it's a stretch it's a stretched system um, but it it was happening all over the place once you kind of look around like people are clashing and it's because of lack of resources and an inability to actually do anything other than just survive um, certainly that was a big part of it for me I didn't really I didn't think I could express my myself fully through the NHS I thought it'd be quite a basically quite a difficult place to spend my whole life so and did you imagine that you would did you ever think oh go into aesthetics full-time or did you just think you'd do it on the side and but it wouldn't be your future um well I didn't I so the same reasons I always wanted to be a doctor I still haven't gone into aesthetics full-time I still do one day a week but um it's certainly be, it's become much it's I do it for very different reasons to how I used to. Yeah. I don't need the NHS for certainty in my life. I do it because I like to connect with that side of things. Um, so it's, 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 it's a wonderful luxury to have that choice. Um, I, knew, I, I knew right from the beginning that I wanted it a big part because it's, it's just so much more enjoyable. Mm. So whatever I did on the other side, it, it, it's almost about having those aspects where you can put the rest of your personality into, into play, uh, not under someone else's you know stretched agenda you get to decide how you shape things and do things so as long as that was going I could probably tolerate a stressful day once a week and um, and still feel like I'm getting a reasonable balance okay so once you had done your course what was that kind of 
because I, I think some for people listening to this, especially those who haven't got into aesthetics yet, it's sometimes overwhelming to think like, what the hell do I? What's the first thing I do? Like, what do I? Act, what move do I make in the world to make this thing real? What did you do? So, I mean, the first thing we I struggled with was just getting all the kit together. So I remember that being the first obstacle was I can't. I don't really want to start advertising anything if I haven't if I'm not prepared to do the treatment and that. And it's down to the training company I went with, who are no longer with us. Um, but they, um, th- there was I was basically just had the theoretical training, and and I didn't even know where to order stuff from. So that's the first thing. I <laughs> when we started training, I made sure there's a really good answer for the t- for that. So we have our starter pack and other things. But that was a, a significant barrier. And the longer I felt unequipped to treat, almost like the, your confidence starts to fade. So the first thing is getting all your stuff ready. Um, And the next thing, actually kind of before then, I had the idea of like what, I wouldn't have called it this in those days, but what's your route to market? How are you going to get customers? And I just copied Beatrice, basically. She had, she had, had five salons. I was like, right, great. I'll just go and try and find a salon that will have me, which was very nerve wracking for me because I'd never walked into a salon before. They're like a different universe. I mean, we've been to so many hundreds now that, you know, I feel like that's completely gone. But in those days, it was an awkward thing for me to walk into a salon and say, can I do treatments here? So, but that was the first thing I knew that I, my route to market was going to be salons, um, and yeah, that, and and I went off and well, you helped me a lot, and we started getting a couple of salons. But how did you get your first client? Because it's one thing to get a supplier, as it were, which yeah, was we you know we did one, we did that well. But how do you, yeah, like how do you actually get a human being to come out their face injected by you? So it wasn't that sophisticated. We I made some leaflets and posters. Which, looking back, would I mean they're so cringeworthy to look at. When you look back, Aww, you think so cute, but they worked. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lesson in that. I know a lot of people. It's similar on social media. You think is this good enough, and you hold yourself back. And you look back, and you probably will one day think, God, that's appalling, and do so much better. But they, it bloody worked. So mm. I put some posters up, some awful computer-generated images of a face, labeling the different areas, and um, just my name and the price list. And lo and behold, someone phoned. <laughs> I was like, hi, I'd like to do that thing that you said you can do on your leaflet. Uh, you know, and you're trying to act natural. And like, oh, yeah, no, no worries. But on the inside, you're like, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to do it. Yeah. So um, that's what I did. A lot of other people like to go down the friends, the social network, which yeah. is, you know, it has its downsides. I personally was more afraid of treating my friends and family than of treating the public for some reason. I, I don't know why. I just always thought. You know, I'd rather do it from the start as a proper business rather than do the friends and family route. It just felt more straightforward to me. I think as well, like we don't necessarily live all around like too many of our of our families, so I think it's just like a different way of looking at things. But um, I, I mean, also I also wanted to keep it separate from my NHS work. That was a, right. that was part of it. Tell me more. Well, and I think it was right in retrospect. Um, it just adds a question mark to people generally about your motivations and in the early days I didn't have any big plans I, I you know I didn't think I'd do anything until after my all my training which is kind of what happened actually didn't really do didn't really go hard on it until after that um but the but I, but I didn't want I didn't want another story starting up about me um, and actually I did actually have, this is I was right because at one point when I just created my first website I was so proud of it I added on the bottom of my email header and that went to, I just emailed, you know, as you do, people at work. And a little rumor started up on my first GP job that I was a bit slow with my paperwork. And that was probably because, well, oh, the, yeah. the, the rumor wasn't that I, I was slow. The that. rumor was that I was building my business. And actually, at that point, I was seeing one client a month and actually not doing anything on it. Like, it was, it was nothing. But I was doing the paperwork wrong. So instead of just highlighting what needed to be coded, I was actually coding everything myself, which I didn't know someone else was meant to do. But the length of time it took me, and the combination of the email addresses that someone there started this idea that it was because I was, I was constantly somehow building my business while I was wow. in my in my lunch break, um, and that was really sad because it went around everyone and no one told me until one of the doctors came around and said, look, I, there's all these rumors going around. I think it's wrong that no one said anything, so I'm going to say something to you. And I always appreciate that doctor, and then I was like this mind blowing moment. I was like, what you mean? I don't have to actually enter all these codes myself. I thought that's what I had to do. And uh, and we all laughed, <laughs> um, but yeah. But but the thing is, it's that thing of like where where is where is your energy going? I think it's true with human relationships all across the board. You know, if you know, 
it's the, it's the same with your partner like if they're really interested in something that's outside of the family and we've had this discussion before sometimes that's like it can create a sense of uncertainty mm-hmm. so that's what happens with your colleagues um if you but having said that there are plenty who are making who basically build their businesses through their network at, at on, on the nhs so it depends on your personality and how you play these things and what your friendship what your colleagues are like but many of them are driving their businesses for them so i'm not saying it's 100 percent right but i had one bad experience with it yeah i think that in regards to that people all the people that i speak to most of them do worry about delegates who, who come to us or you know people who are in aesthetics do worry about the interaction with their nhs colleagues but i i kind of feel like you can't hide it like it's going to come out and so you need to sort of almost have a word with yourself and decide how you want that to go um and and almost really challenge it in your own mind yes people are going to be jealous yes people are going to think you know some people will think you're you know oh, I don't know, you've, you've, you've changed or whatever, but you, you really can't let that stop you. You just can't. If you are falling in love with aesthetics, as you did, then, you know, you just have to weigh around, find a yeah. way around the Well, it's a timing thing. It's a timing thing, though, because I knew I wasn't going to leave until I finished all my GP training. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't that, at the time, that was still my priority. Yeah. Now, so if you're not at that stage and you're thinking, if I can get out of this in three months, I'd do it, then you should go all in. Like, I do think you should go all in. And yeah, some people will... We've discussed this a lot in the mindset group. Some people will um, not like you for it because it feels like you're leaving them behind. Yeah. You, um, but that's the price you pay for progress sometimes. But Most people, all they have to do HR-wise with the NHS job is just email their manager and say, I am now doing this. It doesn't conflict with my work. And just mm-hmm. leave it at that. And it shouldn't conflict with your work because obviously you're not doing cosmetic treatments in the NHS. So yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. That is key. And then the rest is mindset. So... so You've obviously you've, you've got going. You're doing you doing the sprinkling of clients. Did you ever think of, you know, did you ever think, God, is this really worth it? You know, do, shall I just go back to the NHS? Um, well, I think if you build a business, there are various stages that you go through, which never stop actually. Where you you're going well and you're growing, and then you hit an obstacle, and then you either overcome that obstacle or it or you get stuck and you want to give up. And obviously, the longer you're stuck, the more it feels like. Um, this is me giving up time. But if you overcome it, you normally go through another another phase of growth. In fact, that is literally it. Like you, you hit a limiting factor, you conquer that limiting factor, you grow again, and then you hit another limiting factor. And that repeats indefinitely. It's happening to Apple computers and it's happening to the, your first, you know, your, from your first client to having 100 clients, you're hitting these obstacles along the way. So yes, there were many of those. I think probably the first one that the, the easiest one to kind of miss is the petering out one. Like you get one salon, you get one client, you get excited, um, nothing else happens after that. Uh, maybe maybe you get one more and then and it dies. Like that's, that's a possibility. So um, I think there was a stage at the beginning where there were quite long gaps between clients and yeah. it could have gone either way. I did remember thinking this could just end up not, I could just not get another client or lose interest in it, not really want to drive it. Um, so that's probably the first limiting factor is how do you, how do you actually get enough clients so, so that you believe this is really going to work? Um, and that's about not being, I think we ended up getting quite a few more salons quite quickly. So we had one, we got some success from that. And then we, then we tried to get five and then, and that was, that was one, one way to do it. And then obviously there's, there's lots of marketing things that you can do as well. It's, it's probably another yeah, podcast. Yeah. So the, our, our particular was, this is back in 2008, where I remember people saying, oh, Facebook's no good for advertising. Wish I, I, wish <laughs> I could, wish I could uh, go back in time and know what I know now. But um, the, so, so there's, the, there's that element of um, route to market, getting started, not petering out. But then the next thing is you, you reach a limit, you reach other limits clinically as well. So... There was a point which I've gone into in depth on my on my webinar, which I'm sure we'll do again at some point, um, where complications became an anxiety. It actually, looking back, I actually didn't have a complication. I just had normal side effects that I just wasn't fully equipped to treat, so it would create anxiety in me. You know, and you, and you still have. I remember having anxiety over did I suddenly wake up at three in the morning and thinking did I inject four units instead of two yeah. units? And you never had. You never had. You had that few times. Yeah, in those days, you don't have the you don't have the experience to know that i mean basically all of them were fine because there was a point where i was still worried and you weren't worried anymore because you're like you always say this and it's always fine 
Um, so I, but you're, every time you stray into new territory and, it, and the new territory might be a centimeter difference in the face where you're injecting, there's an element of uncertainty. And if you can overcome that um, and start to basically develop a, a more comprehensive understanding of how it all ties together and how clients are likely to react, um, then that, that's a, also a big stepping, stepping stone. You have to go through experience. The biggest variable is the person treating and the, the things they say to you. It's very hard to teach. Um, I just did some training this, this weekend and um, with someone else we were learning about a new procedure. And the thing I realized I was getting most from was the practical tips, the things clients say. Um, there's a lot of that stuff that you have that's very hard to teach because people are all different, but there are patterns that you formulate. Um, so learning that you can stopping being anxious every time the phone rings for a follow up or a, or a text message. Um, that's a big part of it, because once you're free of that, you can get on with building a business instead of having the the kind of nagging uncertainty. Yeah. So that's all about your clinical skills, particularly complications and side effects and follow ups. So at, you mentioned at the beginning that you the thing that led you to aesthetics was this dream of potentially having more control over your life financially, but also that you wouldn't have a, you know, some boss kind of bearing down on you and, and you wouldn't have to have that negativity that you were experiencing in the NHS. Did you, I'm curious, like when did you start to fall in love with aesthetics and think, yes, this is going to provide me with that? Like what was the moment that got you thinking, yes, this, you know, I'm not hundred percent sure, but this could be it. Um, it was it was basically when we started to do the financial planning, I think, when I could sort of see see the route ahead. Now, I often use the analogy of the shed that I built as a as a as a, a way of describing human motivation and how there was a point where w- before we had the shed, I wanted one and I could see what it would be like to have one. It's no ordinary shed. It's like basically another <laughs> house like it's it's pretty big. And I, I had this vision of how cool it would be to have a creative space and to have the kids able to paint in there and stuff and me able to make things and maybe do videos or whatever. Um, but I didn't know how to get there. So I didn't really have a lot of motivation. It was just an idea. And then I got a guy around to come and quote. And as so often happens with these things, he just never got back to me. And that was a dead end. And so so I, I didn't have that much. I still wanted it, but I wasn't ready to go and take massive action on it. Um, until I started, I thought, let me just Google what it's like to make a shed. And I just Googled, there's like so many great videos that literally, visually is very important for me. I can see the struts going up. I could see the nail gun having, I was like, I can buy a nail gun. I can put the struts up. And suddenly I went from being vaguely kind of wood to, in, into a shed with just believing I could have it so clearly that I just had to assemble the pieces. And that's that happens with your business too when you do good planning. So if you can see all the bits and pieces all linked together and it's given you the thing that you really want, suddenly you just think, well, the only thing standing in the way is for me to actually do it. Um, so the planning was a really important part of getting motivated. So the financial planning, like how many clients would it take to hire someone to have a clinic? How many clients do I need before I can step back from the NHS? That was huge. I really recommend you do it. You work out your average treatment value, how much profit you're making from each client, how much you need to reinvest, how much you need to live on. Um, how many clients you'll need to see a week? How how much how how do you get a client? How many how many how can you replicate that so that you can do more each week, etc. Until you can just go for it. So th- then then you, your certainty goes through the roof and you act. So your certainty went through the roof. But what about your when did your heart engage? Like when you were you've been doing aesthetics for a while. So you'd already done your calculations. You got your certainty. This was gonna you know be worth it. When did you kind of think, oh yeah, this is cool? Well, I mean, I was always, I always had an element of this is cool, although I wouldn't have carried on. Um, I remember one of my first toxin clients, just, just being so happy, and and I was amazed as well because you know, if you, it's, <laughs> you know, you don't you don't always see amazing before and after so quickly. But she came back like two weeks later just to say thank you and to show me her face. I need a follow up, and obviously I'm still at this age of like, oh, I hope it's all right, and hope it's no. Yeah. And all she could do is say. She's still a kind, I think. Um, you say how wonderful it was. And, you know, I connected with her and I liked her as a person. And then she was living this better life. And I was like, that's really cool that I can achieve that. Um, she also said she also said a few things which I'd not heard before. Like, you're clearly really good at what you do. Aww. And th- there was a, definitely a stage where I was getting feedback from the market that at that stage, I didn't believe that yet. I thought it was just like anyone else. And then they'd come and say, oh, you know, the thing you do here is really different. Or I've had it before and it really hurt. And all these things start coming back and you're thinking maybe I'm actually quite good at this. Um, then you see the impact. Uh, and then certainly once the bigger treatment started to come in, then I, 
now it's my favorite i'd love nothing better than to have three hours and and 12 mils to play with and uh, you know a nice client who's going to make a good psychological difference to them then i'm really happy put some music on transform someone's face and it's the best i still would love to do that any day of the week so i really got into the the practical side of it but that that was more that was a slow burning i think because certainly when i first started it was quite basic like there wasn't there wasn't a lot of the more clever stuff we can do now yeah but basically what you felt was job satisfaction it was like you yeah. do a thing someone comes back and says wow that thing that you did was amazing yeah absolutely yeah and and that and trusting yourself you know i had this i started to develop the sense that i can i can actually reliably predict that i'm going to achieve this result yeah. people like that that does that is something that so it's not a roller coaster it's yeah that creeps up on you with experience yeah there's all, and that doesn't matter how you do your training there's an element of proving it to yourself and and doing it by yourself it's a bit like your driving test you know you can be safe but there's a whole other thing just enjoying driving you know that's what happens over time so if you could kind of look back and let's say that you were talking to your younger self from 11 years ago what would you tell that Tim to do differently in building this business? I think um, I'm trying to go right back. I think I could have been, you, you could be demanding, more demanding of building the kind of business that you want rather than what you think you have to do to survive. Right. So there's, you know, we certainly changed direction as well. I mean, I don't think it would have gone down the salon route because it does a lot of traveling between different places and you can't control the environment. If I, I just thought that's what you had to do. I was copying, basically copying Beatrice. And it's worked really well. And it's not... But I, m- I might do it slightly differently. I might have focused it more on one area hmm. and done more kind of web and social. I certainly would these days. Um, but it's the biggest... It doesn't really matter what tactics because some people... The salon is still a great way of getting clients. It's not, I'm not poo-pooing it. It's just that I think you can... Now I believe I could probably have, have actually asked myself a more important question than what do I need to do to build an aesthetics business? It would be, what do I actually want yeah. to build? And then being staying true to that and asking yourself questions that, that enable you to build the thing that you want rather than the other way around. Oh my God, I feel so strongly about that. For example, to make it real, there's one practitioner I'm thinking of who she is, so she in her NHS was it like a district nurse she goes out to people's houses and dresses wounds and she loves the act of physically caring for someone and so an important I think I don't know whether she ever sort of thought about this beforehand but a really beautiful thing about her business and I think one of the reasons it's thriving is because she has a home salon basically that's attached to her house which then feels intimate it feels you know super relaxing and she's in control of it and so as a result, and she loves all the skin quality treatments. I mean, she does the, you know, she does the Botox and fillers as well, which she loves as well. But she is able to do the thing that I think she's basically been called to do. It's like to care for someone physically and give them that. So it's, it's more of an experience. So if, I don't know whether she did do what you just suggested, but she just naturally crafted her business to fit her personality and what she loves. Yeah, well, this is something that I realized about our business when I started to get the feedback from what happens in other businesses is I realized that a lot of, a lot of the things that I was getting good feedback were, were with the things that I was expressing that are my values and my, my way of operating in life that, and some people get into business. I think business is now a separate thing. Yeah. Um, they don't realize that actually your business is a vehicle for you to express the best of yourself to the world. Um, and that usually is what people are looking for anyway in the market and we've got lots of examples of these you know people who thought oh, i'm too old to get into aesthetics or i'm too young to get into aesthetics or whatever but the, actually when they when they can forget thinking about the fact that they don't fit the cardboard cut out they're imagining and yeah. just be themselves and put that out into the world that there are enough people who can see that true benefit that you're delivering and that you can build a business at any age i mean and that, that you will resonate with that those specific people so your vibe attracts your tribe so if you are maybe in your 50s and you think to yourself oh god you know i'm not achieving this kind of perfecty perfecty you know maybe i do have a bit of a jowl or whatever that's what you think but actually you're going to attract people who love 
the fact that you are sort of an image of them and that, they, and that well, maybe you'll be more yeah. to be more discreet and less uh, and maybe less pushy or you know whatever they're worrying about the client you'll understand their problems yeah. you've got the same the same issues and they won't be judged by you 100 yeah. percent. and and they whatever your fears are of i'm not that cardboard cutout there are millions of clients who aren't that cardboard yes. cutout either yes so you know maybe if you're 27 and gorgeous and glamorous that you're going to attract those kinds yeah. of clients because they're looking for that but if you're 58 well, there's plenty of 58-year-olds who also don't want to be intimidated by the 27-year-old yeah. and want someone who's had lived a bit and, you know, has had whatever, kids or whatever, and you can talk about those same issues because you can't, you can't connect with people who are too different to you. So you can build a business around your own personality, for sure. But you do, and those are the best businesses because they're exactly. unique. They're not, everyone can spot a cardboard cutout. Exactly. That's what I was basically just about to say, which is that if you're going to choose a non-cardboard cutout business model, which is that, you know, for example, in this, this case I was telling you about before, so she's chosen that kind of business, but she's communicating that as well. So she communicates love and care, very much, very important part of her brand. And she will do that when I say communicate. I mean, in the appointment, because of course, a big part of brand building is about actually living living your truth, basically, and, and having amazing customer service or whatever your vibe is. And also in her communications, as in externally, so her marketing, her Facebook posts, her, you know, website, blogs or whatever it is she does it comes that comes across you can't for example be 58 and be like right i'm going to attract lots of 58 year olds and then try and be you know a 35 year old sassy meme creator or whatever it is you've got to you've got to be that and but communicate that every day yeah absolutely well i think the word brand sometimes makes people think they've got to create something from scratch that's separate to them but really your brand is just the way that you communicate specific values that you share in in a visual format yeah but if they're not true then that it, it's not a brand anyway it's just a logo there's a big difference between a logo and a brand brand is something you earn over a long period of time yeah definitely it's what you do as well as what yeah. you say you're going to do so just dipping back again into the practical i remember you saying back in the day oh god you know i'm a bit worried i'm going to get sued like you said earlier you worried it would be a bit american litigious kind of this world have you found it to be well touch wood and you always have to because, you know, when you're putting a throughput of a lot of people through your business, it, it's, I'm just going to say it's going to happen one day, but so far it hasn't. And I think I know one of the reasons for that. Well, I know, I think I know several of them. The first thing is very few people actually can be bothered. They, they're not lo- looking to sue. I mean, you do get those people who, you know, know the system, you know, the same people who throw themselves in front of cars or cause, you know, break in front of lorries to get, but they're very few of them. Most, most people come to your clinic because they want a good service. And if they get that good service, mainly that they feel cared for, yeah. then they don't want to hurt you. So the number one way to avoid getting sued is, is to really care about your patients a- ahead of your defensiveness. I think a lot of people get sued when they're defensive. In fact, I have a, one of my patients had a great story that always stuck in my mind, which is she tripped and fell in a shop, bashed her head and cut it quite badly left her handbag there in the in the melee of, uh, of what happened and then came back to get her handbag and at that point the shopkeeper was very rude to her and, and basically threw out of it out of his sh- out of his shop and didn't want him he basically accused her of doing it on purpose or something like that and at that point she wasn't interested in suing him but she was so outraged at his at his reaction to her returning just to get her handbag that she's like well now i feel really aggrieved like there's something there's a there's a there's like a moral injury on top of the physical injury now, and now I'm angry. And she went ahead and sued him and, and, and won. Um, but that really struck me as a, like he, if he'd given her some love and attention, she would have felt better, so much, so much better that she may not have actually sued, but it, it all became part of this, this, even the scar she had was part of this, this you know, spiritual wound almost of like how bad mankind is that you yeah. can be treated that way. So she went out to go and correct it through the legal process so there's definitely something i think a lot of people end up in trouble because they get defensive and they think oh my god i'm gonna get sued i need to like start being official and quoting the consent form and the worst ones i hear i've heard of patients ringing for help and then having the consent form quoted back on them on the phone well it says on chapter you know line three that you might get cold sores and meanwhile the patient's like what do i do about my cold sores Um, and that makes you angry because you're like these people don't care about me and then if someone doesn't care about you and you're injured, well, you need to basically, you get aggressive. That's just a human behavior. Mm. So the, the, I think one of the reasons 
well, I personally have not gone down that route is I'd, I'd go the extra mile for people who are in a state of uncertainty. Like I really do chase down everything. I'm going to see someone next week I'll probably talk to for an hour and a half over all sorts of tiny, which would, might seem really tiny to other people. Like why are these the issues? But I want, I'm looking to seal off every avenue of uncertainty that she's got. And, you know, she, people are complex. But if I can do all of that and do it with love, like yeah. as as opposed to judgmental, like okay, I, when I when I say love, it's empathy. You know, yeah. I want I want you her to know that I care about her not feeling uncertain, and I will chase down every element of that. She she's much more likely to, even if I can't do anything for the particular issue, she's vastly more likely to think, well, fair enough, he's done everything he could. I all my questions are answered. I know I know the lay of the land, and he gave me an hour of his time, and that kind of process. Um, it's just so so valuable to protecting your relationship and your um, reputation, which is not why I do it. It's more for the individual and preventing yourself getting into that. But it's basically what a good NHS practitioner would do anyway. Exactly, and I think people think that they have to be someone new when they go into business. They're like, oh, now I'm in business. I've got to have a business briefcase and a business attitude and I've got to be business minded and all business is is the exchange of value between two people in this case always yeah. uh, kind of cocooned in the relationship there's always a relationship there and with any relationship you need love and boundaries and the, the boundaries are yes obviously you can't keep giving freebies away for 50 million times just because someone is slightly disgruntled there is a line but if you can do that with care and compassion and you can show them that you hear them Mm. honestly that's the that's the crucial thing people just want to be heard absolutely but also as you're talking i was thinking basically my gp training which at the time a lot of gps resent it because they haven't got time to do in 10 minutes to do all the things you feel like you haven't got time but it was the best investment ever you know because essentially it's incredible sales training but ethical sales the training you talk about that. The gp yeah. training communication skills but if you think about this is what all i only say that because all healthcare professionals have to do an element of this you, you take a patient in front of you with a need, you f particularly GP, because it's it's less like I have a gaping wound on my leg. Um, you know, then it's clear. The sales process is easy. Would you like me to stitch up the wound in your leg? You know, there's not, there's not a complex sales process. But when the need is more higher level, like I have, you know, I feel on the back foot in social situations because I used to be the battle of the ball and now I'm 38. You know, that's more complex. You've got to really connect with people on a different level. But it's the same thing. Identify the problem, produce some potential solution, make sure that the person knows that they you identify with them, so then you feel connected. Okay, I understand your problem. This is a GP skill. Um, what's made you come today? All these things that trigger the real story. It's actually a lot of the stuff that in GP we don't want to hear because we've got time. Mm. So we want to know, we are tr you're trained to do it, but when you, but you basically, you, you want to solve the biological problem or the pathological problem. So I've got a sore throat becomes, well, do you need antibiotics or not? But the real reason someone's there is because they have a recital coming up and they can't sing or they've got a presentation or they have a fear that it's throat cancer. And as soon as you get the real story, your solution is so much more powerful. And it's basically what all healthcare professionals should do all the time. And you can bring this to you with aesthetics. You're just meeting a human being with a problem. You need to identify the problem gain trust with that person by talking about the problem, making sure that you understand them and then offer them some solutions and be true to your solutions. They have to do what you say. Um, then you maintain trust, you build a relationship, you build a practice. So when you got to the point of, just to be clear, you do a half session, well, a half a day session of NHS, but you do that not because you have to, because actually you're, you've got a, a waiting list as long as you're on in, in your aesthetics, but you do that because you want to. But when you came to the point of reducing down your NHS significantly, how did you plan to leave the security? Well, this is the thing that I hinted at before with the, that, that a stepwise plan gives you certainty to act. So yeah. we actually had this rather exciting year starting, I think it was in June when, or no, it was August when I would have finished. And I knew that I knew we had this plan to get, we knew how to get clients. So we were going to replicate that formula and get enough. So we could, we basically hired if effectively four members of staff of having not taken a penny out of the business for three years. So you and I just basically saved a lot. We had enough reserves to take a punt, but we knew this is the scary thing. We knew at that point that the moment we hired all those staff that we were going to start making a loss. I wasn't actually generating enough to pay for all of them. But we had this formula that was going to get us by I think December or January 
into profit again. So it was literally like, I remember thinking it's like a plane heading into the ground, gaining speed and you're trying to pull up and you've got a plan to how to pull up. But that was, that was my leap in, into aesthetics was, okay, I trust the plan. Let's replicate it and go for it. Hell for leather. And, you know, we pulled up. You, you'll, just to clarify, you'll leap into away from the NHS to, to reducing yeah. down your hours. It's a financial Obviously, you'd already been in aesthetics for three years. Yeah, but I'd, I'd stopped my NHS income and I was yeah. trying to replace it with aesthetics yeah. um, and changing the business a lot. So I cut off one income, full throttle on the other income or on the plan to get the other income up. So it's the same principle. It's like, just, just look at the numbers. No, and when we say the numbers, we don't mean some ridiculous spreadsheet or anything like that. It's just basics, isn't it? It's like, yeah, keep it simple. Yeah. What, what's it, what does your average client spend? How much money is left over? Um, what do you need? Because the big mistake people make is they think if you sell something for £200 and you, your product costs £100, your profit is £100. Well, it's not because some of your time must be spent earning money so that you can eat. Like there's, there's no other option. Like you have a that's what your wage is. So you have a wage, then you have you know, you need to you need those are your your direct costs. You probably have to pay some commission or a prescriber, so that comes off it as well. Um, insurance. Insurance is an indirect cost, but they're, that's all pulled in. Um, so your indirect costs. You're also going to have to if you want to stay in this in this industry get more training. That's in there as well. There's a cost that you have to keep spending. I'm still doing training now. You have to keep paying for training. That goes into your costs as well. So what you're really left over is much smaller than most people think. And because they get that calculation wrong, they, um, they lo you lose interest because you think it physically isn't, you're not making any money. So why would you keep going? So what so, you need to do at the beginning is be realistic, but still know that there is absolutely a life here. And, and what tends to happen is that people who stick at it and are realistic, they fall head over heels in love with it. And, and then they have this beautiful thing yeah. that it's theirs to it's to theirs to create and craft and and to add that beautiful value and job satisfaction yeah well the one thing i did really well at the start of it is i accepted the advice of the person who told me what prices to choose instead of um basically listening to the market who of course want it as cheap as possible so you know and we still get calls today and we always have right from the beginning saying oh i can get it cheaper elsewhere and if we listened to all those people we'd be charging you know 100 pounds a mill and we definitely wouldn't exist so it's there's an element of um pricing correctly taking the advice and then yeah you may you may not get five clients as quickly as if you're cheaper but it'll actually be worth your time seeing those clients and you've got time and money left over to reinvest in your business so it's it doesn't have to you know i'm not you don't have to charge a fortune but definitely don't if you compete on price you're you're on to a loser unless you've got some other niche that you're going to you're going to get a lot of attention somehow. There are people who do it on price, but there's not room. There's not room for a lot of people to be the cheapest in town. There's only one spot. Everyone else is onto a loser. So looking back, these eleven years, do you are you glad that you made the decision to come into aesthetics, or do you sometimes fantasize about just your a quiet life in GP? No, I'd rather die. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the the reason being that when you say a quiet life in GP, I, I love general practice and I love the NHS. It's a very noble thing and it's so valuable. And I, I respect the hell out of everyone who, and I'm gr so grateful for all those clinicians who just devote all their time for that. But me personally, I need growth. Uh, I need new things. I need excitement. I want, I want to be ch really, really challenged, like completely out of my comfort zone. At least once a year, I need to feel like, Jesus, this is a whole new thing that I've got to learn now. Um, you know, like this podcast, an example of that. The first time I did it, I was nervous. The first time I did a video, it's still online. Terrified little talking corpse, I always say. <laughs> it's hardly moving at all because I was, I was so scared. Um, so I, I, I don't think I would have done that in GP. So it's it's not, it's that saying it's not really about what you get. It's about who you have to become. Yeah. And that journey is worth uh, worth more than any money I'll ever earn from it. Like I've, I've learned so much about life and you know myself and that is that's really what it's all about like obviously it's difficult it's not if you if you just want an easy life don't start your own business but if you're up for some you know really testing yourself and learning and growing and mastering new skills then absolutely like you you're going to get that even if you fail <laughs> but um but that's the thing to do it for which is you want to see what you're capable of and all the 
beautiful relationships you make along the way as well which yeah. are like which are like you NH- can make you can make beautiful relationships in the nhs though but this is this is different your own business is a bit more like it's wilder oh yeah it's more intense it's definitely wilder but it is when you see someone light up because now they can go confidently to their first date that they've had since they were divorced so they haven't had a date now for you know 23 years and you've given them the confidence by doing their botox like it's it's totally beautiful and that's and that that moment even if you don't carry on with that relationship it's it's a beautiful thing to behold to see in someone else's eyes well that i 100 percent agree with like there are various stories i can tell you that i actually get emotional about trying to re- trying to retell them because it's it's so amazing to me I, one of them uh, I'll, I'll quickly tell is a someone who who had looked after her mother with dementia for 10 years and she felt like she'd lost 10 years of her life she used to be really into dancing and um, that was one of her that was her identity i'm a dancer and she gave it up for 10 years and then she got to the end of looking after her mother and she thought she'd lost it she thought about going back to dancing and she just thought her story was i'm i'm too old i just don't belong on the dance floor anymore it's over and she came and saw me about it we had a long chat got this whole story out did a really good procedure that worked fantastically on it and it put her back on the front foot and she went dancing again i'm like that's amazing like you won't really think about your your face being the thing that stopped you but this is what people are like like they have a story running about some element of themselves that's holding them back you change the story for them with your skills and they literally go and live a different life it's it's so beautiful that if you can do that um and you can you can tie those pieces together for someone yes yeah, incredibly rewarding but that's what i'd say is that's in terms of my personal needs that's like that's high on the it's quite far on the list of needs that people meet in the normal sequence um you can try and do it all simultaneously but it you know there's it's that hierarchy of needs like certainty a lot of people go into aesthetics because they want to increase their cash flow because there's more month and money and why not you know we've had great stories from people in the mindset group of real situations in their lives where they didn't have enough money to, to support their kids in a way that they wanted to. And they thought, screw that. I'm not putting up with that. I'm going to do something. Um, and those people got certainty out of aesthetics. They now have enough leeway in their life to give their kids the things that they want. And I think that's great. But that's, that's number one on the list, certainty for a lot, a lot of people. You might then get significance. So a lot of people, and this is something a, a lot of NHS workers will resonate with, you feel a bit lost in your environment. You're just another person mm. in the team and you do your best and you're trying to help each patient, but it's a conveyor belt. And you sometimes wonder, would anyone notice if you weren't there or not? Um, or maybe they, they notice when you're not there, but there's no, there's no significance to it. Like you're not doing anything that someone else couldn't do, but you think in your heart, I think there's more to me than just providing that foundation layer. Um, there's also the thing that resonates a lot with me is variety and growth, like doing new things. Maybe you're just bored with the repetition uh, of the same job. Um, Maybe you've got all the skills you can imagine getting in that arena and you want you want growth. A lot of people, I know Dr. Sharon, who works with us, loves new things. She's all about growth and getting better and improving. And that's something that resonates with me as well. I love that. I love to feel like there's more that I can learn and do. And I never feel like I'm finished. I always feel like I'm just starting. Mm. So growth's important. Um, and then you get on to contribution, which is what you're talking about, which is the most beautiful one of all because it's that's the imprint that you leave on the world while you're here and absolutely but i'm trying to picture this from someone who's just looking at starting aesthetics or just in the early days you may not have had that that drive yet it's something that comes as you meet your other needs is you know once i'm not not worried about whether i'm i'm going to cause a complication or not and i'm starting to give into the givings phase then then you get that long lasting the stories you remember for the rest of your life um that you've done for people so that's you can meet all your needs through aesthetics but it's probably a sequence that you go through yeah oh wow it's amazing to go back down memory lane i've enjoyed it and and i love hearing i love sort of recapping on the rise i love seeing other people's rises as well and um recapping yours and my rise as well it's, it's, it's a gorgeous thing thank you yeah well we're both doing things we never thought we'd we would do and um a podcast is one of those things but there's endless things we've had to do and there's more in the future we're still doing still getting out of our comfort zone thanks to having our own business which is um which is a great thing a wonderful vehicle yeah 
Okay. Thank you all very much for listening. I hope that was interesting. Any questions or comments, or if you think someone else would like to hear this, uh, if you tag us, if this is on Facebook, or um, or share the podcast, we really appreciate that. And reviews as well, we really appreciate. I know we've got a few reviews now coming up, and they're great. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>